Okay, so yesterday we started talking about uh, microscopy techniques just kind of briefly at the very end of class. Uh, I didn't have a microscope with me at the time so I could demonstrate all of that stuff, so I do now, okay? Um, I am never going to ask you to label a diagram with a microscope, okay? I know that at some point somebody's probably required you to do that. I will not. I just expect you do know what everything on the microscope is called so that if I refer to it, you know what I'm talking about. Okay? If I say the coarse focus knob, you know which of the two knobs I'm talking about. Or if I talk about the arm, you know what part of the microscope I'm talking about. Okay? Because I'm not going to say that doohickey or thingamabob or whatever. Okay? I'm going to use the technical names okay, for the parts of the microscope. So I do expect that you know what they are. We'll just quickly review that here with the microscope I have at the front here. Uh, this is the dust cover. Okay? It's an important part. It's not the one that came with it, obviously. That one just ripped. Okay, so we have these extra large freezer bags that also protect them from dust. So they're multifunctional. Okay. Um, all right, so with the microscope, these are probably a little bit different than the ones you have previously used okay, um, at the junior high. All right, um, these have uh, some parts on them that are a little higher end. Okay, uh, those parts that I'm referring to directly would be the ability to move the stage. Okay, the stage is obviously where all the action happens. Okay, that's where the slide goes. Okay, where your specimen you're going to be observing will be placed. Okay, the slide clips or the slide holder is probably a little different than what you're used to. Probably before all you had was a flat stage that had two metal clips on it, and you would slide the slide underneath those clips, and they would just hold it in place. Okay, on this one, there's a little uh, hinge here on the right. Okay, you'll move that back out of the way, slide the microscope slide in here, okay, and then let it close, it's spring-loaded, okay, um, and it'll close onto it, and then using these two knobs right here under the stage, okay, you can move the stage and the slide around without having to touch the, the uh, slide with your fingers. Okay? Because previous to this, you probably had to do that. And every time you move the slide, you push the stage down and get it out of focus. Okay? This allows you to maintain focus while moving this, the specimen around. Okay? And that's important for getting it centered. Once you've found it on the scanning power that we talked about yesterday, you're going to want to use these knobs to get that specimen on the end of the pointer so that when you move up to a higher magnification and smaller field of view, okay, you can still see your specimen. So you kind of follow me on that? Okay, so these are the stage adjustment knobs. This is obviously the stage, and this is the um, slide holder. Okay, now um, above that, obviously we have the objective lenses. All right, uh, there are four spaces for objective lenses. Our microscopes only have three, and okay? we don't have the oil immersion lens that goes on the fourth uh, hard point. Okay, um, so they are in order of magnification. The red one. Okay. It's the scanning power lens, but the one with the red band on it okay, is the one that you will start with. Lowest magnification, biggest field of view. Okay. The one with the yellow band on it okay, is the low power lens. Okay. It's slightly higher magnification, slightly smaller field of view. And then the one with the blue band on it is the high power magnification. Okay. Uh, their, their magnification's in order 40 times, 100 times, 400 times. Okay. Okay. So when you're looking under the microscope, okay, um, you're getting quite a range okay, of what magnification is available to you. All right, those are all placed on what we call the revolving nose piece. Okay, that is this part here. Because if this was a face, that would obviously be the nose. Okay, and so these are all on there, and it turns, thus revolving nose piece. Okay, and then we have the um, ocular lens, okay, and the housing for it. Okay. Um, this is the body tube right here that the ocular lens sits on, and it rotates. Okay? This is especially important when you are working with a partner. Okay? Because now, you don't have to move out of the way all the time. You can just turn that part so that they can look through it. Okay? Especially important during a pandemic, where we don't have to all be handling all the different parts of the microscope. Okay? You can just kind of turn the lens so that they can look through it. All right. Questions there so far? So that's the top half of the microscope. Okay, the bottom half of the microscope, so below the stage, okay, there's a couple of things here uh, that allow you to adjust the amount of light that comes through uh, to, the, to the specimen. Okay, so you've got your condenser, 
okay? That's this silver the chrome piece right here, all right? Uh, you can adjust that a little bit, okay? It just kind of adjusts up and down, right? And all that does is kind of, it literally condenses the light a little bit more, so if it looks like it's a little bit dim, okay, you can, you can adjust that. And there's also the condenser diaphragm. It's an iris, basically, okay? So it'll iris shut and allow more or less light to come through, okay? The purpose of that, it helps you to increase the contrast Okay, that's the difference between light and dark when you're looking at a specimen. Sometimes it just makes uh, structures inside it kind of jump out when you adjust it a little bit. Okay, uh, and then below that is the light source. Okay, the light source is operated with this handy dandy switch on the back labeled on and off. Okay, um, so you just need to activate that and the light will come on. It also has a rheostat. Okay, it's a dimmer. Right? So you can adjust the brightness of the light source with the rheostat here at the bottom. Okay, the last thing. Power cable. Pretty much every microscope in the lab looks like this one. It has had a second power supply soldered onto it because people don't handle these properly. Right? When you are carrying the microscope, like number one here, okay, it is always carried with one hand on the arm and one hand supporting the base, and that hand that's on the base needs to be in control of the power supply. Okay? If not, the power supply tends to fall on the ground, at which point you usually step on it, and then with a you know the yank, because you startle yourself that suddenly the microscope stops moving, you kind of trip, and usually you rip it right out of the back. Right? So while you are carrying the microscope, you will have the power supply in one hand, that same hand will be supporting the base of the microscope. The other hand is here on the arm, okay? That's how you carry it at all times to ensure that the power cord does not get pulled off, okay? Everybody with me there? You make sure you carry it properly. Each one of these is $650, okay? So you don't want to wreck these. Because if they fall to the ground, you'll hear the clattering sound, then you'll hear the thump sound, then the ambulance sound. Okay, so those are all the parts of the microscope that we'll be uh, using, okay? Um, always remember that we want to return that microscope, not the way I have it right now, but with that lowest power or scanning power objective lens in the viewing position, because that's the one the next person is going to want to use. The other reason for that is the next person to use it is going to expect that it is in position. And they may not realize it's not, they should, but they may not, and what they'll do is with the high power lens in position, they will grab the coarse focus knob, that's this big one, and they will crank it because they expect the small one is in place and you can use the coarse focus knob with the small one, at which point they will drive the high power lens through the slide. Okay? There's enough torque here, okay? and if the settings, the braking screw here has not been set properly, okay, um, you can actually crush the slide with the lens. Okay, which usually damages the lens, and that makes the microscope useless. So always make sure that you have a scanning power lens in position when you return it, and when you are using the high power lens, do not use the coarse focus knob. Use the fine focus knob, okay? That's the smaller one, okay? Two reasons for that. Obviously, you don't want to break anything, okay? But secondly, using the coarse focus knob, look how much, look how much the stage moves when I turn that knob. Like, this knob can only make about a half a turn before it hits either end. And so it moves the stage a great deal. On high power, even the smallest turn of that will go right through focus and past, you won't even know that you've passed the point of optimum focus because it'll go by so fast. The fine focus knob, on the other hand, okay, like I'm turning and turning and turning, and you can barely see the stage moving. Okay, it gives you a lot better control over the level of focus. Okay? So always make sure you use the fine focus knob when you're on the high power lens. The coarse focus knob can be used on the other two. Okay. Um, right. We always start with the lowest power. We talked about that yesterday, but I'll go over that again here in just a minute. And then for cleaning purposes, okay, uh, for cleaning purposes, we always use lens paper. Okay, it's a special type of paper that we have in the lab okay, that is used for cleaning the lens because the lenses get dirty. 
right? People are looking through them. You know, you're always shedding flakes of skin, dust, and all that kind of stuff. Okay, and the lenses get dirty. Okay, people are touching them, and the lenses get dirty. That's fine, but you need to clean it with lens paper. Okay, because the lens paper is clean. It has no grit of any type on it. Okay, the problem that we have is that people, well-meaning people, okay, they're like, oh, well, it's just a little bit dirty, and they take their shirt and they go like this. Okay. Well, your shirt can have grit on it, even f even like fine dust that you maybe picked up while walking. Okay, um, you can be made of hard materials. Okay, some synthetic materials are even hard enough to scratch the lenses. Okay, um, you can have oils and stuff like that from your body on your clothes. Okay, and all of those can foul the lens. All right, but most important, we don't want to scratch the lens. Okay, uh, the other part of it is like I've seen people do this. Oh, the lens is dirty. Yeah. Gross. Okay, I mean, not even in COVID was that okay. Okay, don't lick your finger and rub it on the lens. Blah, because I've seen that. It's just disgusting. That's how you get an eye infection. Okay, gross, man. Okay, don't do that. Just come up and get the lens paper. Okay, give it a quick clean. How many times do you use the lens paper? It is single use only. Think of lens paper like toilet paper. Okay, you use it once and you throw it away. Okay, um, because it's going to pick stuff up. It's going to pick up those oils, that grit, and we don't want to uh, then rub that on another lens. Okay, so you use one piece of lens paper once and then you throw it off. Okay, everybody good with the cleaning techniques there? Okay. Um, when we are done the lab, obviously we have to wipe down the microscopes with a sanitizing wipe. Do not wipe the lenses. Okay, so. You can go everywhere else, all around, all over the parts that would be touched, okay? But nobody should touch this part with their face, okay? Um, there should be no need to clean the actual lenses with the uh, sanitizing cloth because it leaves a, a film on there and it does weird stuff when it looks dirty. Okay, so don't clean the lenses. You can clean everything else, okay? but not the, don't actually touch the lenses themselves, okay? All right. Now, in terms of our uh, fields of view, we were kind of talking about this yesterday. Okay. When we look through the scanning power lens, okay, so the first one that we view, we see a really big, well, it looks the same no matter which lens you're looking through, but the amount of area you see on the scanning power lens is really big. Okay. The field of view for the scanning power lens, this part you're going to need to write down, Okay, the field of view for the scanning power lens, so that is the diameter of the big circle you see, is 4,000 micrometers. Okay, that's 4 millimeters. 4,000 micrometers is 4 millimeters. This symbol here that I've drawn, that's mu. Okay, it's the Greek letter M. Right? Because we can't use this for micrometers. Why? It's already used. Right. Okay? And I also have people who do this. Okay? They go, oh. Micrometers. Nope. Megameters. That's what that stands for. Okay, you know, like megabytes and gigabytes and terabytes. Okay, it's all metric. It's all the prefixes. Mega means a million. So if you write that next to something that you know, you're telling me you know, my amoeba was 300 megameters, it was 300 million meters. That's big. I would want to run in to that amoeba anywhere. Okay, so just make sure you're using the proper um, symbols. Now, when you're putting this in on the computer, you can actually insert that symbol but I would also accept if you used a U. Okay, if you just go with lowercase letter U, I'll know what you mean. Okay, so sometimes we say mu M or U M for micrometers. All right, so scanning power lens, 4,000 micrometers across, okay, and it is 40 times magnitude. Anything we look at underneath that lens will be magnified 40 times larger than actual. Okay, when you go to the low power lens, I don't have a yellow one, so I'll just use green. Okay, when you go to the low power lens, okay, you're going to be looking at a field of view that is 
is smaller because the low power lens magnifies 100 times and has a field of view of 1,600 micrometers, so slightly less than half of um, your first one. to the high power lens, okay, the long one with the blue band on it, your field of view is 400 micrometers, okay, and it magnifies 400 times. probably thinking, all right, that's wonderful. Why is that important? Okay. Here's why it's important. One of the things you're going to be required to do when you make your lab diagram is to estimate the size of the object you're looking at. Okay. It is just an estimate. You don't have to calculate it, but it is an estimate of the size of the object. So if I'm looking at something under my 40x lens, my scanning power lens, okay, and let's say I'm looking at um, a letter E, because that's one of the things we'll, we'll be looking at tomorrow, okay? Um, it's going to actually look like this when I look through the lens, okay? It's going to look upside down and backwards. All right, so the distance from here to here is 4,000 micrometers. Approximately how large is the letter E? of that space, roughly, something like that. So how big is a quarter of 4,000? A thousand, right, one quarter of four is one. Okay. All right, so this would be about a thousand micrometers. It's just an estimate, okay? It doesn't have to be exact, right? But if you told me it was 3,000, then that's a little off, okay? A thousand, I'd probably accept anywhere between 800 and 1500, maybe somewhere in there, okay, as a reasonable estimate for how big that letter E would be. All right, so that's how we estimate the size of an object. We know what the fields of view for each one of the lenses are, okay, and we just take a stab at how big the thing we're looking at is based on that distance. Are you all right with that? All right, uh, we already talked about all the parts of the microscope. Oh, look at that, I already had that diagram there. Anyway, okay, uh, so we got those fields of view. Hopefully you wrote those down. Actually, they were in your notes, I forgot about that. Okay, um, and we already talked about estimating the size of an object, so we're good there. All right, I would like you guys to answer those three questions right now. I'm gonna give you about five minutes, okay? Get the answers to those down. We're gonna go through them, and then we're going to uh, start working on our pre-lab stuff here. Okay, let's quickly go through these here. So, uh, what are the three points of the cell theory? Point number one, all organisms are made up of cells, okay? Point number two, what do cells do? Carry out the basic functions of the organism, okay? And point number three talks about where cells come from. Cells come from the division of existing cells. And those are the three points of the cell theory. Okay, the four people considered to be the most important in the development of the cell theory? Okay. Hook. Hook, okay, what did he do? Uh, he turned the uh, magnification of light, turning the core fusing to different lenses, created the optical view that made the two core signal over bigger. Right, okay, he basically was the first person to observe cells. Okay, that's a pretty important thing. All right, uh, and then the second person, okay, was Leeuwenhoek, and he looked at living cells, so he saw that cells were not, in fact, the empty little rooms that Hooke thought they were. Can't blame Hooke, he was a physicist. He didn't know what 
before, okay? Um, so, he, uh, he Lehman Hook discovered or looked at or observed living cells, found they were not empty, okay? That they were mobile, that they were busy living places, okay? And then, the last two people actually worked together, and they were Schleiden and Schwann, okay? The two Swedish scientists who came up with the original cell theory. All right, and then for number three, on what basis can we deduce that plants and animals may have had a common ancestor? We talked about this just briefly the other day, okay? But when I look at a plant cell and I look at an animal cell, what do I see? Not just similar functions, but also similar structures. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so they both they both have a lot of similarities. Okay. In both their structure and their function, too much to have been evolved separately by coincidence. All right. Any questions on those? 